uh, when bakers prepare to make cakes, they shop for ingredients, plan the design, proceed to spend several hours of make, mixing, baking, cooking, cooling, more designing the cake till I deem it perfect, then the cakes are ready to present. Well, the Bible says, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. Woodworkers have an idea for new projects, and they sketch their design and measure. Purchase wood, install, install, spend multiple hours sawing and hammering until the project is done. That's funny. When I was going on all these mission trips to Europe, we were doing Habitat for Humanity type work, building schools, things like that. And somebody said that I was the biggest sawdust manufacturer in Europe. Didn't make anything worth anything, but made a lot of sawdust. <laughs> but the Bible said, says, and God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together and let the dry land appear. And it was so. Attempting to produce something is a great reminder of our humanity. Especially when we think about it, how God created the world. A baker has to plan and do this and then so does a carpenter or woodworker or whatever. God just speaks and his creation is perfect. This is a beautiful reminder that he is eternally powerful. And all know it. And it leads to the attributes in our Creator today. And all we have to do is remember whose we are, where we are, and stay in touch with mm -hmm. or her, or whoever you deem that to be. <coughs> God's always there. Uh, God's been with me through the dark times and the good times. And you know, it's great. I have a strong faith in God. And uh, as you know, I went to a little problem, not a little problem, a big problem. The spouse fall, and, and God has, so far he's seen me through, and I know he will. Um, and I thank you. It, you know, the, the good thing about Sunday school or church is you've got light minded believers and they're very supportive. <coughs> I couldn't get by without you. And my wife is struggling, but she's got friends at her church. And I think they become more social friends. And, but they're still friends. Absolutely. And uh, it's got her through this. We grieve in different ways, but we still grieve. It's the only way we can get through things. I have moved against my will, been transferred by the company five times. Every time they said, well, that's where we're sending me your paycheck. <laughs> and I needed the paycheck, so that's where I went. And every time I did that, I found a church home. And it really, really made a difference. So I recommend that. I recommend God. God will see you through. Amen. 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 Genesis and not only to really the very beginning because it's the first story that we read about in the Bible after Adam and Eve sinned that better that better okay thank you so in our lesson 
this unit is entitled God, the source of justice. And today's lesson is justice, vengeance, and mercy. But it might also be called the God of second chances. So our lesson today is one, as I said, one of the familiar ones from the book of Genesis in the Old Testament. And all of us growing up, I'm sure we heard the story of Cain and Abel. What were, if somebody asked you, tell me the story of Cain and Abel, if you were like I am before I really started reading and studying about this particular story in the Bible, I would have said, okay, Cain and Abel, Adam and Eve's sons, Cain, and Abel brought a sacrifice. God accepted Abel's, not Cain. Cain got mad, he killed Abel, and pretty much end of story, except for God did spare Cain, put a mark on him so nobody else would kill him. And that's pretty much what I would have told you the story was. But it really goes a lot deeper than that, because it really shows us how the sin that was committed by Adam and Eve in the garden goes on now to follow the human race. So I'm going to read to you the lesson for today. It's Genesis 4, 1 through 15 from the Message Bible, which is done in more contemporary. I like to read it sometimes because it, sometimes it just makes the story a little bit clearer. Adam slept with Eve, his wife. She conceived and had a son, Cain. She said, I've gotten a man with God's help. Then she had another baby, Abel. <clears throat> Abel was a herdsman and Cain a farmer. Time passed and Cain brought an offering to God from the produce of his farm. Abel also brought an offering, but from the firstborn animals of his herd, choice cuts of meat. God liked Abel and his offering, but Cain and his offering didn't get his approval. Cain lost his temper and went into a sulk. God spoke to Cain, why this tantrum? Why the sulky? If you do well, won't you be accepted? And if you don't do well, sin is lying in wait for you, ready to pounce. It's out to get you. You have to master it. Well, Cain had words with his brother. They were out in the field. Cain came at, came at Abel, his brother, and killed him. God said to Cain, where is your brother? He said, how should I know? Am I his babysitter? God said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is calling to me from the ground. From now on, you'll get nothing but curses from this ground. You'll be driven from this ground that has opened its arms to receive the blood of your murdered brother. You'll farm this ground, but it will no longer give you its best. You'll be homeless, a wanderer on earth. Cain said to God, My punishment is too much. I can't take it. You've thrown me off the land. I can never again face you. I'm a homeless wanderer on earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. God told him, No, anyone who kills Cain will pay for it seven times over. God put a mark on Cain to protect him so that no one who met him would kill him. Cain left the presence of God and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. So the names Cain and Abel came from the Greek, except to Jewin, a 2,000-year-old Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, where the names are written K-A-I-N, and then Abel as we know it. In Hebrew, Cain is spelled Q-A-Y-I-N and Abel, H-A-B-E-L. Cain means to acquire or possess something, which is why Eve said, I have gotten or acquired a man. The word hovel means to be empty, often translated as vain or vanity in a sense of being empty of substance. Abel was a shepherd and Cain was a tiller of the ground. When Adam was spell expelled from the garden, he was sent to till the ground. Therefore, Cain, who is the elder, takes on the profession of his father, which is a common custom 
during the he uh, in the Hebrew culture. And interestingly enough, Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, are not Hebrews by definition, but they are the forefathers of the Hebrew people. Because the definition of Hebrew is a member of the ancient people who, according to biblical tradition, descended from the patriarch Jacob, who was the grandson of Abraham. So that's where the word, when they were, they were called Hebrews. So Adam and Eve were before the time of Jacob. So the two men brought their sacrifices to God. Cain, who was the farmer, brings the food from the ground that he farmed. Abel brought the flock, from, a sheep from his flock. When we read that God accepted Abel's sacrifice but not Cain's, we're not told why. And I think that's been something that people have puzzled over and studied over. And uh, one uh, commentary I read said that's the thing that always goes back to raising more and more questions. What was it that God said to Cain and to Abel that made one acceptable and one not? So we think perhaps it was because Abel brought the best of his flock, which we later learn when God gives his law to the Israelites and explains the sacrifices, the different ones, that the animal sacrifice was a blood sacrifice, which was a sacrifice of atonement. And the grain sacrifices that they gave were more of thanksgiving and a gratefulness. So perhaps that was it, we don't know. Or it could have been a difference in their attitude. Maybe Abel came with a contrite heart before God, and maybe Cain just said, okay, I'll do this because I have to do it, and here's what's left over from what I don't need or what's left over. We don't know. And nowhere, interestingly enough, right in this part of the Bible are we told that God had explicitly ever asked for this type of sacrifice from the first family, from Adam and Eve. But even before being codified into Israel's laws, righteous men, as we read, as we go through Genesis, offer sacrifices to God. So it could be that Cain and Abel were following an example of Adam. And it's possible that God had even given Adam and Eve instructions about sacrifice before they left the garden after they had sinned. But we do learn that Abel's, as we said, Abel's sacrifice was acceptable, Cain's was not. After Cain offering was totally unacceptable, he became very angry, he lost his temper, and he sulked. But even though God was not pleased with Cain's offering, he still didn't totally reject Cain. He told him that he had another chance, that he could have his offerings accepted. And that's when God gave his first instruction about sin. He tells Cain that if you do what you should, you're fine, you'll be right with me, but if you don't, sin is lying in wait for you. It's ready to pounce, it's ready to get you, and you have to master it. God is a God of mercy, and our second chance is there if we will only do what he tells us to and follow him. Cain does not heed God's warning. He allows his anger to grow and ends up committing the first murder. And it's probably even the first we would call premeditated murder. He, just, he obviously decided to kill his brother. He got him out into the field, maybe even one of the fields that came farm, in the hopes probably of hiding what he had done from God and from his family, maybe even burying Abel. But as soon as Cain kills Abel. God asked Cain where his brother is. Cain said, I don't know where he is. 
And then the famous line we all know from the other versions of the Bible, Cain says, am I my brother's keeper? God said to Cain, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Cain quickly learned, you can't, you can, we can, I can't hide our actions from God. Just like Adam and Eve learned in the garden. So even though at this point God didn't take Cain's life for killing Abel, there were steep consequences for his sin, for killing his brother, and not only killing him, but then denying it. God told Cain that from now on, he would get nothing but curses from the ground. He would no longer be able to farm the ground because the ground had opened up its arms to receive the blood of Cain, of Abel, excuse me. He would be, Cain would be a homeless wanderer of the earth. If Cain could not be trusted with his brother's life, how could he be trusted with God's land? The land would resist all of Cain's efforts no matter where he went. Cain couldn't run away from his problem because no matter where he went, the land would not be farmable to him. He would have to roam the earth without a homeland. And up until this point, we sort of gather that Cain had not been remorseful. But once God tells him this, that he will no longer have a homeland, Cain says to God, my punishment is too much. I can't take it. And he realized, he feels like God is totally abandoning him. He says, you've thrown me off the land and I can never again face you. I'm a homeless wanderer on earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Cain believed he was going to be outside of God's care, and the Lord would not help him be his keeper. He was also fearful of his own family's desire for vengeance for Abel. Cain was convinced that his guilt would be known in any case and that while God did not kill him outright, he was effectively sentencing Cain to death. But God told Cain that would not happen. Anyone who put a mark, who, anyone who would kill Cain would suffer vengeance seven times over. Because as we know, later on in the Bible, God says, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. So the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who found him would kill him. God once again shows that he is a God of mercy. He recognized that Cain was right, and people are inclined toward evil from birth, and the desire for revenge is often very powerful and a motivator to act with evil, violent intent. Vengeful people do not trust God or leave vengeance to Him. They take it themselves to repay evil. They organize mob actions against the canes of the world. They authorize and deputize someone who is willing to do whatever is necessary to rid the world of any and all threats that they perceive toward their community. Cain would have to live with the consequences of his sin, but he would live. While our sins come with consequences, we know that through Christ we are spared death that is that natural consequence of sin. You know, we question, what was the mark that was put on Cain? We don't know, but one study I read said there's a possibility that it was two crossed sticks, which would in all be a cross. Because the Hebrew word translated as mark is the word ot, O-T, which is used in biblical text to mean a sign. In non-biblical text, it is used for a letter as in a letter of the alphabet. The Hebrew word for the mark is tav, T-A-V, 
which is the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And it is written as a picture of two crossed sticks. A cross, which is also a sign of a covenant. So it's possible that God placed on Cain that letter that was a sign of the cross as a sign that God was in a covenant relationship with Cain that nobody would kill him. Cain's exile, he sent him away into the land we call, the Bible says, of Nod, where he goes on to build a city, has a wife, and has a family. So his exile was a reflection of God's boundless mercy. After Cain murdered Abel and denied doing it, God allowed him to start this new life. And was, he was marked with, it prevented him from being killed. Through these acts of mercy, God reminds us that even in spite of our weakness and sin, God is a God of mercy and second chances. He does not delight in the death of the wicked, but longs for them to repent and live. Christ died for all of us. 1 John 1, 9 states, If we acknowledge our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from every wrongdoing. Let us pray. Merciful and just God, teach us to trust in your justice and timing. Give us the faith to extend your mercy, which you have lavishly poured on us, to a wicked world that needs it neither more or less than we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then about leave one key. Good. Does anybody have a joke they would like to share? <laughs> Bill isn't here today. I forgot all about our joke time. If not, let's um, stand and uh, we'll be dismissed. Okay, let's see. Let the words yeah, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead and start it. <laughs> Let the words of my mouth and meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. <laughs>